right, everybody, welcome back. So it has been a while since I made a lager, and uh, I've really been feeling like I want to have something nice and very crispy and refreshing to have during the summer months later on when it gets a little bit hotter. So I figured I might brew a low-strength lager that I can finish out in a month or two and uh, see how it goes. So what we're doing today is a uh, Munich Dunkel, uh, which is a dark lager that's not very strong. It's not as malty as a Bach, but it's certainly not light or hoppy at all. Um, it's basically your standard Bavarian dark lager. Um, as far as German dark lagers go, this is probably the least dark uh, of them all. So there's the Dunkel, there's the Bach, which is a stronger, uh, more malty, slightly sweeter finishing beer. There's the Doppelbach, which is literally double Bach. Um, it is the stronger and even more maltier version of the Bach. And then we have the Schwarzbier, which is actually not very strong in alcohol, but it's very dark um, and has a completely different character than any of the other beers that I mentioned previously to this. Uh, so we're going to go for that Dunkel. That is the easy drinking, five-ish percent, uh, very, very drinkable, slightly malty, somewhat dry, not very hoppy, standard dark lager uh, of the Bavarian regions. It's going to be uh, a nice beer to do, and I've also been wanting to use my new uh, Kieser as a fermentation chamber, so now I can actually very precisely control the temperature of this lager fermentation, and then of course control the lagering phase in a keg. So that's going to make things a lot easier on my end and uh, I've still managed to set that up in the apartment setting so I'm pretty happy about that. Right now it's the middle of June so I'm hoping that I can brew this, have it fermented in about two weeks and then lager for a month or so and I think it should be good to go if it's not too strong. Um, what we are targeting is probably not the traditional dunkels. So normally a traditional dunkel would be made with a decoction mash, where we would take a portion of the thick mash and take it out into a separate vessel, boil it, uh, and essentially cook it, uh, where you're getting Maillard reactions or browning reactions uh, going on with the malts. That deepens the color, that also brings out a lot more sugar uh, from those grains. Now that's a traditional method because, well, the malts that were used back during the time uh, that this is traditionally brewed in Germany, you know, they weren't the stellar malts that we have available today. So if I were to do that, uh, I would end up with a gravity probably about 20 points higher than my targeted original gravity, and we'd have a Doppelbach on our hands by accident. So I'm not doing that. Uh, today's highly modified malts are perfectly sufficient to do this in a single infusion mash. That being said, if you want to go ahead and brew a traditional lager using the decoction mash method, I would advise you not to do it using the brew in a bag style that I use because it's a very thin mash and as you're scooping mash out, there's a good chance you could tear up the bag and just have a lot of issues. Not to mention the math is probably going to be different given the volume of water that I'm using. Um, I am getting an acceptable result for this. Is it traditional? No. Will it still have the full body that you would get from a decoction mash? Most likely. Will I get all of the flavor and the amount of sugar that I need from it? Absolutely. So here's our recipe. Um, I'm looking at a slightly sweeter version of a standard dunkel. Uh, so something that's going to kind of bridge the gap between a dunkel and a bock, traditionally. So we've got seven pounds of dark Munich malt, four pounds of German Pilsner malt, half a pound of Cara Munich malt, and then 0.4 pounds of Carafa II. So we're looking at probably an OG of around 1.053. So as far as hops go, unfortunately my local homebrew store does not have any actual noble hops on hand, so we're using the derivative of them. Uh, so we're using a, an ounce and a half of Tetnanger, uh, which is going to be the derivative of Tetnang. Um, that's at 60 minutes, and then we're using one ounce of it at 15 minutes. It's basically just a little bittering addition to balance out all that malt, uh, and then just a, a late hop addition for some subtle aroma. So for yeast, we're using the Y-Yeast 2308 Munich Lager. So that's been sitting in a starter for about three days now, so we should have enough yeast to properly pitch for this lager. Um, rule of thumb, if you're not familiar with this, if you are brewing a lager with liquid yeast, you're going to want a starter, or at least two liquid packages, but a starter is a little cheaper. Um, so as far as water goes, we're trying to mimic the Munich water profile, but it's not quite gonna work out because I don't have a reverse osmosis water set up and uh, there's a little bit of ambient chloride and uh, sodium in my water. So this is the best we're gonna get. Uh, so we're basically trying to hit some uh, high levels of calcium and carbonate. So, well, we got 104 parts per million of calcium, 
8 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 18 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride, and 180 parts per million of carbonate. Uh, and in order to achieve these, I'm adding 1 gram of Epsom and 8 grams of calcium carbonate to my water. So we're going to mash at a slightly higher temperature than usual, uh, 154 degrees. That's going to give us a good uh, full body for this. Okay, so my strike water is heated up to about 160 degrees. Uh, so it's time to pull out the heating elements and uh, dough in. Okay, all the grain is in the mash and uh, feels like it's clump free. So I'm just gonna check our temperature. And, ooh, a little high. Okay, this is 156, um, which is, well, it's a little too high, so that's all right. I'm trusting that this is going to probably lose probably three degrees uh, over the course of the mash that has been the uh, consistent thing. So we'll, that'll put us down towards 152, 153 when we're finished with this. So we'll pass through the proper range of temperatures anyway. So we're gonna go ahead and call it good, wrap it up, and uh, wait for 90 minutes. Okay, so it's about 10 minutes into the mash right now. So as usual, I'm just gonna take a quick pH sample um, and using pH strips to determine an approximate pH uh, inside the mash. Okay, so this is uh, looking like it's more acidic than it should be. It's uh, somewhere between 4.5 and 5.0 on this color scale. So that means I'm gonna have to add just a dash of baking soda. All right, mash is complete and it looks like we stayed at about 153 degrees, so that is awesome. Okay, so normally at this point you're going to see a fast forwarded clip of me pulling the grain bag out, uh, letting it drain a bit, and then putting it in a different vessel to drain further. Well, I got to thinking that uh, my boil kettle here, which is obviously serving double duty as a mash done, has a valve at the bottom, and this grain bag acts as a filter. So I'm wondering if I might just be able to drain straight out into a second vessel right there and collect most of my pre-boil wort that way and then just sparge essentially and put more water on top of the grain until I reach my pre-boil volume. That's essentially a very basic dumbed down version of traditional all grain brewing. So this is definitely gonna be a hybrid thing um, and bear with me as I do this, so hopefully I do it right. Okay, so what I basically just did was get um, about six quarts of 120 degree tap water here and 
and add that in um, to add about a gallon and a half to what's left in the uh, actual mash here. Um, so I collected six and a half gallons of a very clear looking wort. Well, I need a total of eight gallons to start this boil. Uh, so I added the remainder and we're gonna see what happens. Now I know that that is not a precise way of doing things at all. I understand that I am well aware that my smart water has to be a very specific temperature if I'm doing all grain. And I'm also well aware that it has to have certain water chemistry in some cases. I get that. I also understand that you have to add it in a certain way. I'm not doing any of those things because when I typically do brew in a bag, I am actually just doing that. Rinsing it off with tap water to rinse the sugars off. And that's all I'm attempting to achieve here because if I try and do anything more precisely, I'm probably gonna actually raise my efficiency and get more sugars out of this than I want. Uh, and that's not something I wanna do today. So I'm gonna collect another gallon and a half of work as, as it sits here for a little while. And uh, then we're gonna see how this goes. Cause this is way easier than me hauling the bag out of my kettle, trying to drain it, and then rinsing it over the kitchen and taking it in and out of a container multiple times. So we're gonna see if I can continue to do this Okay, so the boil has started and uh, we're looking pretty good. So there's no bittering hop addition at 90 minutes. Instead, we're gonna go ahead and put that in at 60 minutes. Uh, so I'll see you then. Okay, so our pre-boil OG is in and it's about 1.035. So that's pretty awesome because that's exactly what we were going for. And considering I drastically changed the method with which I rinse the grain and collect the wort, uh, that is pretty awesome to see that it still was consistent. So hopefully that's something I can repeat time and time again, uh, because I do like that new method more. Okay, so it's now 60 minutes from the end of the boil, 30 minutes from the beginning of the boil. So it's time for us to add our bittering addition, which is the ounce and a half of Tetnanger I have here. It is now 15 minutes from the end of the boil, so it's time to add our chiller, some hops, some whirl flock, some yeast nutrient, a whole bunch of stuff. And then our uh, 15 minute hop addition, which is just one ounce of Tetnanger. So yeah, pretty good brew day. A um, little uh, less involved than most of the beers that I've been doing recently, so. That was kind of a nice change. I could walk away from it for a bit, so. And anyway, yeah, not, not too difficult as far as brewing goes. Fermentation is where it's difficult. So for lagers, normally you actually have to pitch twice as much as you would otherwise pitch. So that's why we make a starter for it, or if you don't want to make a starter, you can just use two liquid yeast packets, and that generally works fine. Um, but that starter is now chilling at about 45 degrees, which is our intended pitching temperatures. So once this cools down to 60, which is as low as I can get it based on my groundwater temperature, I'm going to transfer it into the fermenter, and then I'm going to take that fermenter and I'm going to put it in my keezer, which has been sitting at 45 degrees for a while. So basically that's going to cool down from 60 to 45 over a couple hours, uh, and then I'll be able to pitch my yeast and aerate uh, at that point. So. Basically, we need to get it down to 45 to pitch. Um, otherwise, you're gonna have fruity esters that you don't want in this beer uh, from pitching too hot. But it's really nice to have that teaser slash fermentation chamber now uh, to be able to actually maintain that steady temperature at lager temperature. So we're gonna let it sit there at uh, 45 degrees for about two weeks. Let it ferment out completely. Once it's done with that, I'm gonna go ahead and keg it, and then I'm gonna actually uh, lager it in the keg. So we'll keep it close to freezing, somewhere between 30 and 35 degrees uh, for at least one month, maybe two months, uh, depending on the strength of this. And uh, that, that will allow us to have that clean, crisp lager character that everybody loves. If you're doing this in bottles, you can do the same thing in the bottles, or you can just take the fermenter and put it in a location like your fridge or freezer, if you can fit it, uh, that's like 30 to 35 degrees for that period of time. 
I literally just got kegs set up um, for my last brew and I'm loving it so far. It really cuts down on the amount of space needed and I was surprised by that. Um, so yes, the keyser itself takes up a decent amount of space and it was a lot of effort and money to put together. Uh, but compared to the five or six cases of bottles that I've kind of had and store in random places in my apartment, it's much, much easier to keep everything in a keg inside the keyser. And also you get beer on tap like whenever you want it, which is just so awesome. All right, so the original gravity samples cooled down nicely. It's looking like it's about 1.050, so that's pretty good. Color's not bad either. It's like a nice kind of dark brown, so I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I'm thinking we're gonna get a pretty nice beer out of this. The 1050 is like three points lower than what we were really going for, um, but all in all, that's fine. Three points in the grand scheme of things is not gonna be a big deal. So right now I'm aerating the wort via splashing it into the fermenter, but I'm probably gonna actually end up aerating this again because right now it's just not at pitching temperature. I'm gonna to have to bring it down further to 45 degrees. We're gonna stick this in the keyser once it's ready. Uh, and then once that actually all gets down to 45 degrees, we'll fully aerate it, probably using like a spoon or something, just to whip it up the, uh, the wort, and then we'll pitch our yeast. But uh, for now, I'm just getting it all transferred. Okay, so it is the next morning, so here's my keyser. The wort has been chilling in the keyser overnight, so it should have reached about 45 degrees by now. So what we're going to do is take it out, aerate it, and pitch the yeast. The yeast is sitting in a starter right now, which is also in the keyser, so it's at the exact same temperature. Okay, the yeast has uh, been mixed up in solution, and the uh, wort has been aerated fully, so it's time to pitch. Oh, I just junked the stir bar in there. <sighs> well, that stir bar got sacrificed to the beer gods. So, anyway, we're gonna close this up and ferment for two or so weeks at 45 degrees. All right, so I just pulled a gravity sample from the Dunkel. And it uh, looks like it's about down to 10.30, so uh, it is Monday of the second week of fermentation, so it's been a little slow. Uh, fermentation took a surprisingly long amount of time to get started, uh, about 48 hours of lag time with a starter, so I don't know what happened there. Um, it was just very hesitant to start up. Um, in fact, it's a week later, you know, pretty much, and uh, there's still Krausen in uh, the fermenter. So I'm debating on whether or not to take this out and start the diacetyl rest now to encourage a little more attenuation, um, since it is about 50% attenuated. Uh, so from doing a decent amount of research, I determined that you can start the diacetyl rest towards the second half of active fermentation. Uh, and it's preferable to do that as opposed to when you hit the secondary stage of fermentation. So. Uh, I'm going to try that with this lager. We'll see if we get a bunch of diacetyl or not out of it, but uh, I'm pretty sure we won't if I do a proper diacetyl rest. So what we're going to do uh, is take this out of the fermentation chamber here and bring it up slowly to room temperature. So given the volume, it's going to take about a day or two to get up to about 70 degrees. Hold it between 67 and 70 for two or three days. That lets yeast kind of finish out the fermentation and clean up their diacetyl byproducts. And at that point, we'll take it back and put it in the fridge and then crash that thing down to close to freezing and lager it for a month. All right, so after completing our diacetyl rest, here is the final gravity in the Dunkel. It's looking like it's about 1.016, uh, which is higher than I wanted it to be, um, but that's okay. All right, so now we're gonna start the lagering process on this for the cold storage. Uh, normally, I would probably just put this into a keg and then bottle the rest and then store those cold. But right now, I'm a little short on kegs, so I'm gonna probably try to just toss it in the fridge for a while and then eventually go ahead and uh, keg it. But for the meantime, that should suffice. And we're gonna go ahead and lager this for at least a month. All right, so this has been lagering in the keg for a while. 
Uh, it turns out it actually produced about six gallons of work. So uh, because I didn't actually dial in my calculations before getting the keg uh, together, so I ended up with one five-gallon keg and then about a gallon in another keg. So basically, um, I got a lot of dunkel, and I'm pretty happy about that because this beer turned out really nice. Um, it has been lagering for probably three or four weeks now. Uh, it's dropped totally clean, and it has a really nice flavor that just continues to get better week by week. Um, but right now, I think it's really kind of hit a nice stride. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and review it now, and um, just rest assured that as it continues to lager, it'll probably get even crisper and nicer, um, but this is what I'm gonna show you now. Okay, so I ended up calling it Midnight Snack, and uh, don't draw any conclusions based on the other beer that's called Second Breakfast. This one comes in at about 4.5% ABV with 27 IBUs. All right, so as you can see, uh, appearances wise, you probably can't actually see this, um, but it is actually crystal clear. So if you hold it up to a light, it's got like a really nice dark ruby red color to it. Um, but you know, when you just have standard lighting, it looks pretty brown to black, uh, but yeah, nice dark color. Uh, but the head retention is just something else on this. Uh, <laughs> it's got this ridiculously creamy head. Uh, that I am really happy about and that thing is just staying put not going anywhere so ah man it's just a it's a nice beer to pour into a mug like this and just look at for a bit so next is aroma so the aroma's got like a nice kind of dark toffee kind of like caramel uh, note yeah a little bit of breadiness in there as well, uh, but mostly toffee and caramel. Uh, next up is the body of the beer. The body of the beer is actually very light. Um, it is, since it's not a uh, high ABV beer at all, um, it actually goes down very quickly and uh, you don't really notice it too much on your mouth. Um, the mouthfeel of the beer, is uh, it's whole with flavor. Um, so there's plenty of flavor in the beer, but uh, the mouthfeel itself is pretty light and effervescent. Um, I think I ended up carbonating this pretty heavily, but this is the third beer that I've kegged. Um, and it's the first one that I actually let carbonate over a serious period of time. Uh, I let it carbonate at about 20 PSI for several weeks, um, and it's just gotten really nice. Uh, and I think that might have something to do with my head retention, too. So the flavor of this beer is predominantly like, it's like bread crust. Um, <laughs> if you've ever had like a really dark homemade bread, that's kind of what it tastes like. Um, but there's a, a nice caramel note in there and a little bit of toffee in there. Uh, just like in the aroma, it comes through in the flavor. And it keeps it from being overly bready. It's a really easy to drink beer and it just goes down super fast, but um, this is so, it's packed full of flavor. You got breadiness, you got toffee, you've got caramel, and actually there is a slight, slight tinge of roast in there, just a little bit. You wouldn't have to, you honestly probably wouldn't think about it or notice it if you didn't uh, have it pointed out to you. I probably wouldn't have noticed it if I hadn't put Carafa 2 in the beer, um, but it's just a little tiny bit, but it's actually got a nice complexity to it. There's very little to no hop flavor in this. Um, there's a slight bitterness that just keeps it balanced, but uh, it's really, technically it's pretty sweet, but it doesn't taste that way. Uh, so before I carbonated this, it actually had a really strong sweet caramel note that I was not a fan of. Um, but then it, it lagered a bit longer and I carbonated it uh, and it actually took that sweetness right away. It tastes pretty dry, but it's not. And um, it's just got a, a good balanced malty flavor that's, uh, that's just totally, totally chuggable. Uh, <laughs> the one thing I, I think that this is missing uh, is, is a deep molasses kind of like flavor. That would be really nice. 
This is a great beer nonetheless, and it's really, really nice uh, to drink, and um, has a lot of flavor, but it is missing the dark molasses note that, it, almost like the dark molasses note that you would get in a Bach, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, and I think that comes from a decoction mash, uh, but I'm curious to see if there's a way to replicate that with a single infusion mash, so if you know, please comment down below. But um, overall, man, I am really happy with this. I was almost going to actually talk about this last week, and uh, when there was still a significant amount of caramel sweetness to the beer, um, and I was going to say that I would not include that little bit of caramunic in there. But now, now that that flavor has changed, I would, I would actually not change a thing about this beer. If I had the ability to decoction mash it, I would. But for reasons that are explained in the beginning of this video, that didn't happen. However, at the end of the day, this is probably one of the best beers that I have made in a while, and it is easily, easily my best lager. Uh, having that temperature control in the keyser is just, it's astounding how much of a difference that that makes in the quality of the beer that came out of it. <sighs> yes, so this beer right here is probably like a 9 out of 10 for me. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm only gonna dock at a point because it's not a true dunkel. Um, a true dunkel would have only Munich malt and maybe some Carafa too in there. Uh, but there is not supposed to be Kara Munich in it. But that's only based on what I've read, so there's a total possibility that could not be true. It's just, uh, I'm, I surprised myself with this one. Uh, and I'm really happy that I have over a keg's worth of beer in here because, uh, this is quickly going to become one of my favorites. As you can tell, I've been sitting here for like five or ten minutes, possibly tops, uh, doing this clip, and I've already burned through the better part of uh, 300 milliliter glass here, so it's extremely drinkable. Um, and I'm gonna stop because I should probably finish up this video. But uh, man, this was a great beer, and uh, so much fun to brew, so much fun to actually drink this. <laughs> and also, I brought a growler of this over to a family function. Um, we all know that sometimes family are obligated to just compliment you, but uh, this particular set of family was coming back from three years in Europe, and uh, where they had had many a German beer, and they were quite happy with how this tasted, and told me that it was just right online with some of the German beers that they've had. Now, I'm sure that a lot of that is just them being nice, uh, but it's also good to, to get feedback from other people on these things. Um, but, uh... Yeah, easily one of the best beers that I have brewed in a long time. Very happy with the results on this one, and I will definitely be making this again, and probably not changing a thing. And thanks for tuning in. I appreciate uh, the time that you spent here watching my video, and uh, thanks for making it all the way to the end. So if I could just have your attention for a couple more minutes. First of all, I would like to thank my current subscribers, because you guys are awesome, and your continued support to the channel does mean a lot to me. If you like the video, please consider hitting the like button. Uh, it does help keep my videos relevant uh, to the YouTube community. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or you brewed the beer, or you just want to talk about things, as long as it's civil, please feel free to drop a comment in the comment section below. And if you like watching me brew all the beer that I brew and do these things and talk about beer and stuff like that, uh, please feel free to hit that subscribe button. And if you do so, hit that notification icon, the bell icon that's down there, because then you'll be notified when I upload a video every single time. And I generally try to upload a video every couple weeks or so, uh, depending on the pace of my brewing. But if you are more interested in what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, please feel free to follow me on Instagram. It's at The Apartment Brewer, and there you'll be able to see the beers that I'm working on well ahead of schedule, and uh, possibly stick around for some other surprises in there too. That is updated much more frequently than my YouTube channel. Last but not least, I always put the recipe for these videos in the description down below. So if you're interested, believe it or not, you could actually buy all these ingredients at Amazon. They may not be super fresh when they arrive, so I advise you to go to your local home brew stop to buy them. Um, but if you're interested in getting some of the equipment uh, that I use for my brew sessions that you see in every video, uh, I've included links to Amazon that shows you where you can purchase those for yourself. 
Full disclosure though, if you do click on one of these links and end up purchasing an item, I do earn a very small commission from that. But rest assured, if I earn any money, it's gonna go back into the channel. Uh, it's gonna finance more equipment, more brews, and possibly better camera gear. So don't feel obligated, but do feel free to check those out. In the meantime, I'm going to, well, all right. I think in the meantime, I'm gonna get myself another one of these um, to enjoy throughout the rest of the evening. And uh, I will catch you in the next one. So I would cheers you, but I don't have anything in my glass. So I'll catch you in the next one.